We're now at the point where uh, contractors are going into the homes and uh, in some cases where there's a lot of damage to assess the damage. The worst one I think is going to be around 20,000 or so. Uh, most claims are going to involve principally cleanup and restoration of carpet and uh, make sure there isn't going to be any mildew damage. Uh, I expect these claims will probably cost uh, anywhere from a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. So. The crew of the USCGC Sundu in appreciation. Uh, times have changed, but I think the one thing that's remained constant and has been interesting is, is the devotion to duty, the love of the ship, and the interest in the job that all the crew members over the whole 50 years have shared throughout. It's not low-income housing. Let's get that very, very clear. We're building a center that is a crisis center for families. We want to turn this into a positive uh, mishap. Uh, my brother was a student counselor, uh, uh, guidance counselor at the Ashland Middle School. We want to send a message out to the community, to the students that he worked with, that drink and driving do not mix. And this is our way of doing it. Was it the Wilbur Clinic? Yeah, just like the, uh, the companies run our health care system. The Minnesota HMO Council, which includes Blue Cross, is to the Minnesota legislature what big oil and military industrial complex is to our Congress. An industry so powerful, it can warp debate about important issues. Assure us that if competition does not keep costs down, then regulation will. We doubt that. Big, wealthy corporations have demonstrated over and over their There are strict uh, supervision imposed, intense supervision. There are that say to me all the time, we don't have any alternatives. There's nothing we can do with these young peoners. And what that means is for that first time birth. And uh, one that is more aggressive. I think it's shocking, but I believe it. I see it happening in our communities. I see what used to happen just in big overpopulated cities happening here in our city of Superior. To make it clear that public protection and consequences are, are a judge should be considering equally with the best interest of the child. The judge also should not be looking for the least. Cabrini Green in Chicago. Minnesota Public Radio sees the housing shortage as a serious problem, and panelists confirmed that. They painted a bleak picture as they described what they called the typical low-income housing unit in the city. Holes in the walls, plaster coming off, plumbing, if it ever works, works half the time. Bare wires. Bare wires. Seen I've, I've seen that. I've seen <laughs> so many things like that. Pam Kramer, the manager of Duluth's Community Development and Housing Division, confirmed there is a critical crunch, saying they have about 1,200 families waiting for a place to live. We have people doubled up. We have a number of families that have to seek emergency shelter or transitional housing and live in those units. Panelists said the solution to the crunch lies in creative housing arrangements like the one proposed for Lakeside School. The school board is considering a plan to create 25 low to moderate income rental apartments in the closed school. 
but the plan has met with considerable criticism from the neighborhood. One radio caller voiced some of that concern. I don't think that concentrating poor families, particularly kids, in housing projects works. I think history has proven that it doesn't work. It isolates the kids, it stigmatizes the kids, it causes resentment and tension in neighborhoods. Tom Heistad, the director of Center City, a private nonprofit housing development company, disagrees with that concept. But I don't know that that, that concern of warehousing and, and ghettoizing happens in a, on a scale that way. I, I wouldn't share the uh, Eric's concern on that. The one thing all the panelists and callers agree on is that there is a critical housing problem that's damaging the lives of hundreds of low and moderate income families, including children. In Duluth, Barbara Riles, News 6. December 15th and January 15th of next year to the city. No. Oh. And uh, the phone is ringing off the wall. Uh, uncharacteristically, uh, a lot of interest more than usual. And so changes that might be major, considered major alterations. Well, we're optimistic that uh, the rest of the season uh, that there's some pent up desire uh, amongst our customers and that we'll have uh, good weather and good snow. We've probably had more snow this January than we usually get, also, which the conditions here right now are as good as they've ever been, uh, probably better. Those with money get justice, those without do not. Many people are upset that this man, John Smedberg, an assistant city attorney in Duluth, had OWI charges against him amended in Douglas County Court last week. Smedberg had a blood alcohol level of .12 at the time of his arrest. The legal limit in Wisconsin is .10. The plea bargains generally take place at a .10 or something like that, but not at a .12. This is unconscionable. According to court records, Superior City Attorney Tom Hayden asked Circuit Court Judge Michael Lucci for the charge to be reduced. Hayden questioned whether or not he could get a conviction, saying, referring to Smedberg, while he could not stand on one leg, he did do the finger-to-nose test appropriately during his arrest. And it is terribly wrong, and I think particularly so, with a man in, in the position of uh, Smedberg or Ralph Binger. Ralph Banger is a superior attorney who also had OWI charges reduced by Lucci in 1992. In that case, as in the Smedberg case, it was Tom Hayden who asked for the amendment. Hayden refused an on-camera interview, but he did say that the Smedberg case wasn't particularly unusual and that many OWI cases had been reduced in his three years on the job. In 1993, Douglas County had 215 OWI cases, and while most of them were not contested, only 11 of them were reduced. And in the majority of those cases, the blood alcohol sample was flawed. J. Patrick O'Neill is a public defender in Douglas County, and although he feels Judge Lucci is a good judge, he doesn't feel the Smedberg case sent a good message. The very people within a community who are supposed to be the leaders and who are supposed to set an example I have concerns when they're, the example that they're setting is a demonstration of elitism. In Superior, Ted Rowlands, News 6. run for our statewide office before 
and the name Ann Winnia is not exactly a household word. But I have a long record of accomplishment in the legislature as commissioner in the department. Coming. Well, I'm delighted that whether or not you want to use the measure of how much money I have raised as a candidate, or whether it's the results of the DFL party's straw ballots at the Central Committee meetings, I've always been the front runner. And that's how we intend to keep this race going. Work hard and stay in front. Remaining superpower that gives us both an I think right now we have to reassess what is our main goal, and I don't see that we have that yet. Between two world superpowers. Not only Central Europe, but all over the world. But of course, we are in a new world order. But if you really want to solve the, 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 the welfare problem, let's do away with our present tax structure and come up with something that's comprehensive and capable. There is no doubt in my mind that the current system needs to be replaced. And it needs to be replaced with a system that has as its fundamental principle that people who work should be able to be better off than those who do not. Welfare reform. And we'll start with you for John. All the pressure ridges are loosening up. All of the areas around docks and river mouths are moving, are loosening up, and this is a classic case right here. You got two river mouths feeding in here within a mile of each other. We had three men drowned in five years out here that were snowmobiling, so this isn't just a warning to keep people off. It's a very serious business. So we open our doors and let everyone in and come and check us out. There was a larger crowd than you'll normally find on a Monday at the depot today. Over 5,000 people passed through there to see the exhibits and because... It's, and it's free. free. <laughs> and what a bargain. There was free musical entertainment, free art lessons, free posters, a free clown show, even hugs were free. But the biggest attraction, especially for the younger crowd, was... The trains. There were slideshows of trains, model trains, and of course, actual trains. <coughs> the train used in Iron Will was on display. And that's the water glass. There were trains whose wheels moved and trains that just stayed put. Even free conductor hats were available. There was so much to see and do today at the depot. When it was time to leave, parents had to literally drag their kids away. Not a bad deal, considering the price. In Duluth, Ted Rollins, News 6. Message is out. Now, more Northland viewers choose KBJR Channel 6 for weekday evening news at 5, 6, and 10 p.m. There you go. And I'm just going to brace your ears. What come you here, Cindy?
I'm at a minus two right now in vision, and I'm going to go to hopefully 2020 vision. I started out being a minus six. A minus six means Cindy was very nearsighted. RK didn't improve her eyes enough, so now it's on to this experimental laser treatment. Mark the center of the treatment. Okay, Geraldine, this is your first eye, correct? Correct. Jerry is also here for the laser treatment because her radio keratotomy was a disaster. Um, I thought I knew what I was getting into to begin with. I wasn't, I did not, no. Well, I need to take a look at the pathology, though, know, can I? See how deep we need to cut. I don't have much to lose at this point. Well, and everybody looks at me when I say that, like, yes, you do, you have your sight, but not really. Dr. Lindstrom, I, is highly recommended. Surface mark. Now we're just going to remove the little surface epithelium. You feel a little brushing feeling on your eye. In simple language, the outer layer of the cornea has to be scraped away so the cold laser can sculpt the cornea. Okay, now this is the sound of the treatment. A little snapping sound, okay? It's an ultraviolet laser, which means it's invisible. You can't see the light but it basically uh, vaporizes tissue. And there's no heat involved, it's a cold laser, it doesn't burn tissue, but it's so powerful it actually breaks the bonds between the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms in, in matter. Uh, that's it, huh? All set. Because the laser treatment is still under FDA review, patients can have only one eye at a time treated. We already cleared that. And now it's Cindy's turn. Before I had surgeries, I had to depend on glasses totally. And now I won't have to. That's it. I am. Wow. You know, RK has helped a lot of people, too. This may be the, the technology of the future, but uh, it's still inside of a study. I'm Mel Stone for NBC News. Fill out down to right here. Pat Wilson wants to get rid of his glasses, so he's going to undergo radio keratotomy. I guess after wearing glasses for 30-some years, it was uh, an opportunity to maybe not have to wear them. It's not a guarantee that I won't have to, but uh, if everything goes as good as, as we hope it will, um, that'll be a good possibility. We'll uh, set the diamond blades to the proper depths. So they measure the thickness of the cornea and then determine how deeply that marks the center and where to cut. That marks our outer mark. And this marks the eight incisions. Hold it right there. You're doing real, <coughs> real fine. At this point, a very fine diamond tip knife is used to cut radial slits on the cornea. The diamond knife has bumpers on it so you can cut only so deeply. And this allows the cornea then to flatten down and to reduce their amount of nearsightedness. Bring your chin up just a little bit. Oh, that's perfect, thank you. For most people, radio keratonomy, or RK, should work, should help them get rid of their glasses. But for a small minority, it's a disaster. A year ago, I had radio keratotomies in Madison and they were unsuccessful. All right, that's it. You did very well. Don't this first eye, you want to put a drop in? I believe I was corrected all right up until a couple months, and now I am overcorrected in one eye, undercorrected with a terrible stigmatism in the other. We're going to go on to the other eye. How are you feeling? Good. Good. It went real At this well. point, I don't recommend them. They're too iffy. Chin up a little. Mm-hmm. Good. The cornea will only flatten so much. And if you uh, use guidelines that take those things into consideration, the operation is very successful. Sergio went real nice. Good. You know, I can see better now than I would have before this. But it'll be months before the eyes completely heal, and we know how much RK improved Pat's vision. I'm Mel Stone for NBC News.
And if we want to have exceptional schools, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to uh, pay teachers well so that we keep talent in the public schools. We're going to have to make sure that we have money to make sure that our schools have up-to-date equipment and, uh, and learning materials. The school I'm going back to in Moundsview next year still doesn't have telephones on the teacher's desk so that we can communicate effectively with uh, parents. Uh, we have a computer lab in every school, but we don't have computers on the desks of teachers so we can manage these, the learning programs of students. Uh, we have a long ways to go. Person, I would have to do some soul searching and deciding because people aren't safe. It's not the safe 20 year for sure guarantee anymore. That a lot of people don't make rank or they don't get to get that 20 years and they have to leave early, not even at their choice. to uh, bring paper into the United States and sell it for less than we could produce ours for. So understandably what this did is force us to react price-wise and uh, our pricing began to uh, deteriorate during the first half of 1993 and that of course had an effect on earnings. by the opponents of the Alabama Mall have now created that as a, an option unless we come up with some manner of being able to move forward and keeping him in this particular uh, method in that particular schematic. Escaping along the park area, the board walking retail site, and that's essentially the filling in of slip number one and the filling in of slip number two. And the major costs there are the storm utility lines, extending them, and then the filling in of the slips themselves. That's two million fifty thousand dollars, and that's.
County, we've known from about 200 waters, righteousness like an ever rolling stream. I have three children, and um, I obviously they drink a fair amount of milk and, I, and dairy products, and I'm real concerned about BGH. What does that mean for food security? Japan, 20% of their country is in the having Bayfront Park for that weekend. If we, can. we feel that when a consumer goes to the grocery store, they have a right to be able to choose milk that, that uh, has been produced with RBGH, as well as milk that hasn't been produced with RBGH. The same mass of air that brought the Northland consistent temperatures around 30 below zero has returned, this time with temperatures around 25 above zero. Tracking weather systems around the world and closely following temperatures associated with them is the main concept behind constructing a 30-day forecast. The same air is followed and measured according to speed, strength, and history to determine how it will affect us the next time through. This type of forecast is very useful to many. Sort of thing. So agriculture is tremendously weather sensitive. Another is the uh, hydrologic system in, uh, for instance, the state of Minnesota. We have a lot of lakes. They're all interconnected. And uh, people like the Corps of Engineers make releases from these reservoirs so that they can make room for what they, uh, the precipitation they might think is coming over the next 30 days. Uh, tourism is another industry that's tremendously weather sensitive. The 30-day forecast is most popular with weather-dependent businesses. Certain private weather companies are contracted to provide this service. However, it does have its flaws. It has its uses, but it ought not to be relied upon too strongly because it only shows a moderate skill at this time. The National Weather Service is forecasting a 55% chance of above normal temperatures for the rest of March in the Northland. And that's certainly good news because we will need above normal temperatures to melt this large ice cube. Actually, on Lake Superior, I'm News 6 meteorologist John Jetta. As you can see here, look at the bags. They're just garbage bags. They tore open just throwing them off. Al and Shirley Johnson returned home Friday night to this mess. Someone had traveled down their dead-end road to dispose of deadly well, asbestos. Stuff, An official here. from the Pollution and Control and Agency was on site like this afternoon. Yeah, this stuff is dangerous. Well, yeah, it is. In, in this state, it's dangerous. Jeff Connell suspects the material came from an industrial site because Range of how from, much is here. He says whoever you know, dumped it IMS faces stiff say, fines. But I would say that the penalties could range from twenty-five to over $100,000. These are state air quality violations as well as federal. Basically, we feel somewhat powerless not knowing who did it or, or how to track them down. Authorities have confiscated two protective suits, possibly worn by whoever removed and dumped the asbestos. The Johnsons feel these clues and others they have will lead to an arrest. Sure like to catch them. And they're going to get caught. I'd sure like to nail them. They've taken a big chance and in doing this, and uh, down deep in my heart, I feel they're going to be caught because we have a lot of clues, you know. And um, we will find out who it is. Duluth and Rice Lake authorities are asking anyone who may have seen workers removing like large amounts of garbage bags like these from any building kind of site within the last week to call. Oh, no, somebody's got to know what went on. Yeah. Somebody's got to report it. That's why it's, it's good we're getting some coverage. And what we're trying to show with these lists is that the taxpayers live by one standard and the politicians live by an, a, a much higher standard. Their staff, their benefits, their privileges, everything is at a higher level. And the taxpayers who don't have the benefit of that are the ones that have to pay for it.
There's a definite smell in the air come springtime, but when it comes to movies, the scent is more fertilizer than flowers. It's all those lousy movies rotting away inside theaters. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to run? Where are you going to hide? You've seen them and wondered why. All the really bad films that show up like a springtime slump, like a post-Oscar hangover. Real movie buffs and critics have to stick it out. But there are ways to save yourself from the heartbreak of horrible movies. It's time to learn some secrets of the trade. Come on, police officer, remain calm. Number one, avoid movies that aren't reviewed the day they come out. That's because the studios won't let critics see them in time. And with movies like Cops and Robertsons here, that is the original bad sign. Number two, beware the big star in the movie you haven't heard about. Meg Ryan in When a Man Loves a Woman, River Phoenix in Silent Tongue. The same rule of thumb applies to directors, like Barry Levinson with Jimmy Hollywood. The names alone may carry you in, but you may need a stretcher to get out. You touch her again, you're a dead man. Most importantly, number three, timing is everything. Bad Girls, the all-female cowboy movie, sounds promising, but when you see it slipping into theaters this time of year, you can be sure the gambling boys in Hollywood are trying to hedge their bets. That pretty much sums up the last rule, skip spring movies altogether. But remember, there are always exceptions. Right now, it's the paper and four weddings and a funeral. Two years ago, it was a scary number called Silence of the Lambs. That went on to win the Oscar for Best Picture. I'm Lucy Mole for NBC News. As much as, as the uh, city councilors and the administration can determine is, is the, the most practical and the most uh, effective in terms of, of getting this job done, uh, I can take and run, run and, and do a good job in terms of implementation. Okay. I think it's a combination of economic factors, um, the trickle-down effect of the high unemployment rate. Um, we have a rather high teen pregnancy rate, and I think that trickles down into substance abuse and can generate cases of abuse. I'm a licensed school nurse, which means I've done this, that type of thing. But the staff knows that as mandated reporters, the schools and the nurses and counselors assist them with that process, which is covered by myself and the other licensed school nurse. What's the procedure when someone, when someone maybe a, a child mentions? Ontario announced new restrictions for anglers that stay in Minnesota but fish in Canada. As it stands now, anglers are restricted by laws to how many fish they can keep if they're staying on the Minnesota side of the border. Those restrictions don't hold if the angler is spending nights on the Canadian side. Resort owners in Minnesota were furious, as were state politicians when the new restrictions were announced. In fact, Minnesota passed retaliatory restrictions that have since been repealed in hopes that a compromise could be reached. But nothing has been resolved, and non-Canadian anglers will be forced to comply with the new regulations, restricting the import of the following species. Zero walleye can be brought across the border. Zero muskie as well. Two is the limit on northern and bass, and ten the limit for crappies. There is a trophy provision enabling one fish from each species to be brought back for taxidermy purposes only. In addition, there are some lakes east of Rainy Lake that are excluded. Enforcement is on the shoulders of the Minnesota DNR, who today said they're inundated with calls from angry anglers. If caught violating the new restrictions, there is a maximum fine of $700, plus a loss of the fish. Derek Hines, News 6.
Authorities say 51-year-old Patrick Stubbs shot and killed his estranged wife and another man before killing himself today in Minong. Stubbs had been out on bond after being charged with threatening to harm his 33-year-old so wife, Cindy, just last then, month. Uh, he was arrested, put in jail, and he had on the court hearing on April 15th. At that time, he was on a $10,000 signature bond in order to stay away from the residence. Police say Stubbs used a sawed-off shotgun to fatally shoot his wife and 43-year-old Douglas Ayler of Hayward before turning it on himself. Mrs. Stubbs had filed for divorce after separating from her husband a short time ago. She was living with Aller, who she worked with at a local packaging plant. Police were called to their home about 5.30 this morning, where they found Cindy Stubbs and Douglas Aller dead in a garage. Patrick Stubbs was found dead outside in the yard. Neighbors and community members are stunned at the violent well, act. I think it, it confronts the notions of small towns being quiet places where the world is, is perfect, and that, that, that myth gets kind of blown in a situation like this. this and so yeah. it makes people sad and it makes people angry that, that this kind of thing happens. The couple's three children were inside the residence at the beginning of the incident, but Mr. Stubbs ordered his three young girls out of the home before the shooting oh, yeah. began. It's very shocking. I just hope that those kids will be all right. During, in that period of time, it was customary for the county and the city to come and take drain oil and put it on these dusty roads. That was a common practice way up into the 1970s. And a lot of customers who came to get the oil changed also bought five-gallon cans so they could put oil on their driveways. One of the reasons we're involved as independent Republicans is that the board decision uh, flies in the face of Republican principles. We're talking about free enterprise, uh, fair trade, competition, and uh, wise use of tax dollars. Planning a summer job can be tough, especially if you're young and have limited experience. Enter Youth Employment Services, or YES, which is helping area youth get matched up with potential employers this summer. It's a combined effort of existing programs from the public and private sectors, which should make getting a job easier for young people. It's going to be tough anyway, but uh, because of, I see some economic reasons, but I think uh, letting businesses know that we're doing this, letting the youth know that we're doing this. Um, again, they got one place to stop down and see us. We can make that match for them, trying to find a youth and, and a job. By combining state and local public resources along with those from the private sector, the new program simplifies the old system. Young people can now walk into the state job service and fill out a few forms all in one place. The goal is to provide some 500 jobs for area youth. What we really need right now is employers to come forward and um, you know, offer jobs to these youth in their businesses or in their homes. Um, we have we have a lot of applica applicants on file right now, but we need um, we need employers. Donate things. Oh, it's that's just, wonderful. It's just been wonderful. Yeah. The program is getting attention around the state of Minnesota. Today, the state commissioner of economic security, Jane Brown, toured the facility and said if the program generates positive results in Duluth, they'll duplicate the program in the Twin Cities. In Duluth, Derek Hines, News Six. <coughs>
every American would be required and asked to pay for 1.6 million abortions every year. We see this as resulting in a tremendous increase in the number of abortions that are performed in this country, as well as implicating all those in the Abortion Act itself. And if you start looking at our statistics, uh, about half or 50 percent of our accidents are caused by drinking drivers. So that's one of the reasons we've decided to put this uh, saturation together tonight, to emphasize to the people that we are concerned about it. We want them to have a safe summer and a safe uh, uh, season. Well, the theme is actually flowers, and uh, this time of year it's a great time for planting in Duluth, and so we have uh, a number of booths today that have flowers for sale, and bedding plants, and tomatoes, and lots of good things to put in the garden. Start expounding on your thinking potential. ago when Native Americans began exercising their in increasing numbers there is an absolute groundswell. I will have a lot more co-sponsors on that bill next time, trust me. A referendum by petition to garner 48 percent crime, which it is not now, but it doesn't take away judicial authority, and I don't think we ought to be about doing that. So I am very tough on crime, but I'm not going to deceive the voters of this district. We build the prisons first and then test the resolve of the constituency to pay for it to incarcerate those prisoners. Calvin and Heidi Fearon of Cleveland have a tiny raft and the Coast Guard to thank after their 44-foot yacht sank on the fifth day of a voyage that began in Bermuda. <laughs> Veteran sailors, they were on their way to Mystic, Connecticut, when suddenly their dream voyage turned into a nightmare on the high seas. Heidi was on watch, and uh, I was sleeping in the main cabin, which was a little more stable there, and I heard a thump, and I got up, and by that time, my ankles were already deep in water. There was one impact that shook the whole boat and I thought maybe we hit a whale or something. The Coast Guard heard their mayday and scrambled a Falcon jet and rescue helicopter to the scene. A nearby freighter changed course to offer assistance. This is the chopper that made the rescue. The Coast Guard had to attach an extra fuel tank to make the trip out to the distressed yacht which was 275 miles away from the Coast Guard station here on Cape Cod. Once they got on scene, the rescue took just 16 minutes. We didn't have to go searching for them. We didn't have to spend a lot of our fuel time searching. They gave us a position that was very accurate, and we flew directly to them. To the Fearons, three hours in the life raft seemed like a lifetime, but they survived their ordeal without injuries. If you're going to be on that raft long, even in that warm water, uh, you're going to be cold. And the survival suit would have made all the difference in the world as far as comfort went. And if, it, if we'd been, uh, we'd had to work for a service ship that had been, what, another hour and a half, two hours, 
Uh, it'll have helped me out of the raft, I'm sure. But I have some yeah, sad news to tell you. And I back on like land, a phone call to five children back home. Their voyage cut short. The captain and his mate head home over the road, minus a yacht, but feeling lucky to still have one another. Yeah. Mike Macklin for NBC News, Bourne, Massachusetts. Moose Lake had a chance to see the kind of fish that isn't caught every day. Kale Sanders and Ed Erickson caught a sturgeon that weighed about 95 pounds and was at least six feet long. Now they aren't sure of the exact weight. They didn't have a scale big enough to do the job. The fish was caught last night after a two-hour battle on Moosehead Lake. And, uh, what time of the day did you catch this? He got it on at five o'clock and then it was after seven when we landed it. Okay, what kind of a lure were you using? Using a worm harness with a worm. Sturgeon are out of season right now, so the champion anglers release the monster for someone else to enjoy later. In Moose Lake, Derek Hines, News 6. Engineers crane is busy tonight loading the barge Marcus. The Marcus and the Tug Lake Superior, along with a team of Navy divers, will put in some long days at six barrel dump sites scattered up the North Shore. This year's mission is at the urging of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. There's uh, concern on the state, on the part of the state of Minnesota, over what's uh, what's in the barrels and in. Uh, in uh, an attempt to satisfy their concern, we're going to make this one more, one more attempt and hopefully uh, put it all to bed, uh, satisfy their concerns by getting a good sampling. Four years ago, the Corps brought up two of the 1,400 mystery barrels. They contained scrap metal and concrete. Last year, the MPCA located and marked six dump sites. This spring's mission will focus on those sites, retrieving two or three barrels from each. Uh, optimistically, we can get more than two or three barrels per site. But uh, this type of operation is uh, fraught with a lot of difficulties. Uh, we're out there in the lake. It's deep. It's windy. Uh, things are unpredictable. You never know what's going to happen, and uh, equipment fails much less uh, you have men overboard this time. So this is a higher uh, degree of hazard type of operation and certainly we hope for more than two or three, but we may have to settle for two or three. Security store is a store that's designed for the consumer. Every product in our store is designed so that people can come in and buy it and literally take it home, plug it in, and turn it on immediately. Nothing that we carry requires professional installation. We need to talk to somebody who can tell us what the condition of that ammunition is. It going to, you know, is it still going to be explosive after 50 years underwater? Uh, if it's not, let's you know probably just leave it. I, I, you know, that's that'll be for the experts to decide. There's something down there that's uh, 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 interesting, you know, a, a regular pattern of something on the bottom that uh, looks like something was dumped, um, and we want to see what the, what uh, what those sites are.
what we have to do is complete the crossovers here on the north end of the project and on the south end of the project, get those done, and then start the paving. Well, we had great support from the 8th District in the endorsement battle. In fact, my nominating speech was made by one of the steel workers up on the Iron Range, and we've got a good core of support here in the 8th District, and we simply want to make sure that we don't lose that edge as we go into the primary and general election. and I would pretend that I was the voice of, of this character, that Cinderella or Snow White or anything. And to be able to do that as an adult and be that for other little girls has been really thrilling for me. on lands out here where it's not determined by those of us who work on agricultural lands. We also have a line aware of what was happening with our land app program. I think what, middle 80s? I mean, you're not preying on people who accept anything that's free. A pattern of doing these things so that when a new product comes along, we kind of know the process of how to go about evaluating it and making sure that it is safe. At the time, the Army said it was all part of an effort to develop a smoke screen to hide cities in the event of an atomic attack. But in reality, the smoke was attack boxes were placed in the school, 29 in nearby homes. The report says it wasn't easy finding people to cooperate. I didn't think that they did things like this in this country, and to find out that this was done to me and that we pay or we possibly could have paid the price over the past 40 years is something that has me real overwhelmed right now. Well, the Army didn't lie about it. They just didn't tell the whole truth. And it really wasn't necessary, perhaps, in their thinking that the general population know the whole truth. But as I say, that there was not deemed to be any health risk to the community. The we report says that, that the chemicals were blown been. from generators on the rear of a truck or from rooftops for 10 minutes at a time. Children, one has Down syndrome. Another is profoundly retarded, a 19-year-old still in diapers. The third has a learning disability. She says the family has no history of these kind of medical problems. You're here. At least one in this row and one in this row who are also deceased from cancer. At a school reunion a couple of years ago, Diane noticed that many former schoolmates had serious...
It's our end of the year party for the school patrol crossing guards. It's the way that we try to say thank you to them at the end of the year for going out and working as a crossing guard all year. And it's uh, it's just a way for us to tell them how much we appreciate them doing a good job and for them to come and have a good time. Well, we're relatively a new club. We've only been in existence three years, and for a new club to do this, uh, in my opinion, says an awful lot for the local host uh, club. We have a lot of good members here, and it takes an awful lot of effort to put this together. And values and appreciation. When is it supposed to go? Tonight? Yeah. Well, it started in 1988, and it was just a group of parents that wanted to do something for their seniors, getting them all together for the last time without alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, anything. And this is seventh year. <laughs> So this time it looks like they'll be, uh, with the new ownership, we'll be practicing in Phoenix in a new facility they've built. Uh, Dorothy Hamill uh, will still be very active, even though they have new owners. Uh, she has a management agreement to continue as uh, the chief officer of the corporation. All the way through the project, it's been our goal to to make sure that our event would not interfere with the opening of that bridge at the earliest possible date. You all recall that uh, the project provides for a $21,000 a day bonus for early completion, and of course we will be within that bonus period here. Well, recruiting in the Midwest is exceptionally good for the Navy as a whole. We get a lot of uh, people that are motivated to join the military, and in the Navy in particular, uh, come from real strong family backgrounds, real strong beliefs in the country. And so recruiting is generally pretty strong in this part of the country. I'm very enthusiastic. We've waited a long time, and uh, 
the property is a, it's a viable option, and, and I'm glad to see that uh, the corporation and the union are finally working together, and, and uh, that both sides can see that it should be, it should be run. Yeah.